Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the Appellate Division, 4th Department, released its decision in the case of People v. Alan Jones, which involved the untimely and tragic death of 11-year-old Aaron Maxwell. The court reversed Jones' conviction for the crime of murder in the second degree, commonly known as depraved indifference murder. The appellate court held that, as a matter of law, the evidence before the jury was legally insufficient to establish that Jones acted with the required culpable mental state of depraved indifference at the time that he caused Aaron's death. However, the appellate court found the evidence before the jury sufficiently established the lesser included offense of manslaughter in the second degree. The court believed the trial evidence showed that Jones recklessly caused Aaron's death. The court therefore reduced the conviction to manslaughter in the second degree and transferred the case back to Oswego County Court for the Honorable Walter Hickner Jr. for sentencing on the reduced charge. Manslaughter in the second degree carries a maximum sentence of 5 to 15 years in state prison. Significantly, the appellate court's decision does not undermine the jury's finding that Alan Jones was responsible for causing Aaron's death. In fact, the court explicitly stated, quote, the defendant's contention that the verdict is against the weight of the evidence lacks merit, end quote. The court stated the jurors were in the best position to hear the witnesses, to assess the witnesses' credibility and reliability. The court found no reason to disturb the jury's credibility determination. To be clear, despite its ruling, the appellate court's decision upholds and validates the jury's finding that Alan Jones killed Aaron Maxwell. Today's decision does not cast any doubt on the fact that Alan Jones committed a wicked, horrendous, and inexcusable act against a defenseless little girl. To be clear, there is no doubt that Alan Jones killed Aaron Maxwell. Although this case was prosecuted by former District Attorney Donald Dodd, who indicted the case and tried it under the theory of depraved indifference, please know that this case means a tremendous amount to me and to everyone in my office. I also know that this case means a tremendous amount to all the members of the New York State Police who investigated this case. The troopers and the New York State Police investigators who worked this case did a phenomenal job, and today's decision in no way reflects upon their efforts. As always, the New York State Police were exceptional in every regard. Like any member of our community, I'm saddened by the appellate court's decision to reduce the conviction. In my heart, I view Alan Jones the way the community does. He is a monster. He took the life of an innocent little girl, and he deserves the maximum punishment possible. He deserves a 25 years of life sentence originally imposed by Judge Hafner. Quite frankly, the fact that he will someday be released from state prison sickens me. He deserves to spend every remaining day in jail in a state prison cell. Please know that I intend to appeal the appellate court's decision to reduce the murder conviction to manslaughter in the second degree. I will ask the Court of Appeals, the highest court in New York State, to take up this case and ultimately ask them to reinstate the murder conviction. No conviction can undo this tragedy. No conviction can bring Aaron Maxwell back to us, back to this community that she meant so much to. But I will do everything in my power to make sure that Alan Jones is held fully accountable for Aaron's untimely death. Aaron deserves nothing less. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'll take your questions. Greg, what accounts for the distinction that the court made in its view of Mr. Jones' mental competence and your office's view of his mental competence? Well, 
to be clear, the, the court wasn't challenging his mental competence as so much as the state of mind that he possessed at the time. The area of depraved indifference murder is a very complicated area of law. Uh, there are a number of decisions. And I know at the time that Mr. Dodd, who was prosecuting the case, was aware of the issues, carefully evaluated the evidence in light of the area of law, and made the decision that he felt was best that was most likely to secure a conviction and was appropriate given the facts and given the law. So you agree with, with that initial assessment? Well, I mean, if, if it was you who had been the prosecutor, I mean, you were in the office at the time, that this is the way you would have proceeded. There were healthy discussions in the office at that time. Um, ultimately, Mr. Dodd was most familiar with the facts, and given the facts that he knew them at the time, he had to make a decision regarding which way to pursue it. Um, in part, the court's decision today was based upon a case, uh, UC, that was decided in May of this year. Uh, UC offered further clarification to prosecutors and the courts. Unfortunately, we didn't have the benefit of that case at the time we were prosecuting this. What about the logistics of this? Uh, your, will your appeal slow down the uh, appellate division's order for resentencing? Will that cause that to put that on hold? Um, at this point, we're seeking to essentially stall the appellate division's order and to make an appeal to the Court of Appeals. Uh, we're essentially in a unique position. Uh, we're lucky as a community that we rarely have murder cases, and this is a unique situation. So at this point, we're carefully researching all the areas of law to make sure that we're following the appropriate steps uh, to make sure that we have the best set best chance of success. How long do you think a process like that takes? It I know you don't go through it all the time, but what's your guess? I mean, easily it would take months, if not a year, and potentially more. Uh, we have had some cases that have gone through the Court of Appeals, um, and it can be at least a year, if not more times. So but do you have to file something now to enjoin the process of, of you know, the, I mean, the appellate division said this needs to go back to Judge Hafner's court. Do you do something in the interim to make sure that doesn't happen while you're getting the case together for the Court of Appeals? I mean, what's the process? At this point, we're really looking at that process to see what okay. it is. Um, I, I can't answer that with certainty at this point. Mm -hmm. Mark, are you aware? Basically, what will happen is we will file uh, leave to notice of appeal or leave for uh, appeal to the Court of Appeals. At that point, what will happen will be up with Judge Hafner. Most of the time, a, a trial judge will not sentence a person in that situation simply because if the Court of Appeals takes it, the issue is all, it, it, everything goes back to where it was prior to this appeal, and the Court of Appeals will make the new decision. So the, to answer your question, Dave, I think at this point in time we don't have to file anything. It will be up to Judge Hafner whether he sentences him uh, pending a decision by the Court of Appeals whether or not to take the case. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Can you simplify the qualifications for depraved indifference. I mean, I read what the legal definition is, but can you put it in a simpler way? Sort of break it down just a little bit? <clears throat> Quite frankly, that's something prosecutors have been asking the Court of Appeals to do, to put it in a simpler way, so there was a bit of a clarification. Um, essentially, the Court of Appeals has said that rarely will depraved indifference were to apply in a one-on-one -on -one killing when there's one victim involved with the defendant. However, the courts noted certain exceptions. And one of those exceptions is when the defendant engages in a brutal, prolonged course of conduct against a particularly vulnerable victim. And essentially in this case, we believe Darren was a particularly vulnerable victim. Given her age, given her slight size, particularly compared to the defendant's height and weight, he was essentially five times her size. This was a little girl who was trapped in a room like an animal, stuck behind a cage that was locked. There was no way for her to get out of the room. There was no way for her to call for help. I think any reasonable person looking at that situation believes she's a particularly vulnerable person and would meet the definition of the law. Part of what the appellate court was looking at was, was the acts against Aaron sufficiently prolonged? Do they occur over a long enough period of time? And that was really the key issue when we argued it before the appellate division. 
And that was really the issue the court focused on in its decision. Um, that the medical testimony established that the strangulation took place over a period no greater than five minutes. And the court essentially didn't think that was prolonged enough. So essentially, mm -hmm. to rule that something is, that an act is done with depraved indifference, it has to be particularly violent and over a prolonged period of time. Basically, you have to establish both of those things. One of the things we've established is again, that it's torture or that it's brutal, prolonged conduct against the victim. And again, whether a particular act is brutal enough or whether it's prolonged enough, really that, that's what creates the gray area. The Court of Appeals and the appellate courts haven't specified. They've never told us that, look, unless it's a half an hour, it's not prolonged enough. Unless it's an hour, it's not prolonged enough. Frankly, we're left in the dark to guess, and that goes back to your question. Mr. Dodd, looking at the case law at the time, and everything that we had available to us, believe this was a sufficient period of time. How did the appeals court decision that you cited from earlier this year, and I've forgotten the name of what you cited, but let me see. how did that change uh, things in terms of how the court viewed uh, these, you know, these kinds of incidents? And in part in D.C., uh, there was given greater, greater clarification. Um, essentially, that was a case that involved the beating of a victim in a backyard, and the beating took place somewhere between the period of 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, the appellate court, Court of Appeals, essentially held that that was an insufficient period of time and found that that was not the trade to difference further in those cases. Uh, so again, I think in part the appellate division was looking at that case to say if 10 to 20 minutes isn't sufficient, then the five minutes that took place to Aaron was not sufficient. Is this the kind of thing that requires a legislative solution, an adjustment to the law, rather than waiting for various and sundry decisions to, you know, sharpen the head of the pin even, you know, even finer? It, it absolutely does require legislative action. Um, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but essentially this change in the law took place beginning in 2003, 2004, 2005, in that time frame period. There are a series of decisions from the Court of Appeals. And essentially, under the old law, courts would look at whether the act was reckless, whether it caused the death, and essentially juries had to look at the objective situation to see whether there was depraved indifference by an objective standard. And the Court of Appeals, kind of on its own, said, no, 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 that's wrong, even though we've been doing it for decades. We need to look at the subjective state of mind of the defendant. And essentially, the Court of Appeals at that time, out of whole cloth, came up and said, depraved indifference is its own culpable mental state. And unfortunately, if you look at the penal law, the legislature has said what culpable mental states are. A person can act intentionally, a person can act knowingly, a person can act recklessly, or with criminal negligence. And the legislature has said in the penal law, those four states of mind are the relevant culpable mental states. The Court of Appeals on its own decided they knew better and created a fifth culpable mental state. Really, what this does require is a legislative action and action by the governor to say, no Court of Appeals, you've overstepped your bounds. If we'd intended to have depraved a difference as a culpable mental state, we would have written it in there. And I would hope the legislature and the governor would come forward to clarify the penal law and put it right in there. Depraved indifference is not a culpable mental state. I have no doubt that if this was under the old standard, before the Court of Appeals started tinkering it, that this conviction would have been upheld. Hypothetically speaking, if we don't get that solved, how soon would the If the appeal doesn't go up, I, I don't know exactly <coughs> when he could be sentenced. Uh, again, it depends in part about when we take the appeal and what the court decides to do. And at this point, I'm, and I'm never in a position to speak for the court. Well, if there are no other questions, I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good evening.